Okay, good. Thank you for coming to this uh, third lecture uh, today. I remind you where we were last time. I'm also recording here. So uh, first of all, a correction. Uh, last time, apparently every time I have to begin with a correction. So last time I think I was uh, a little over enthusiastic about uh, this definition. So I, once you have, uh, we, uh, we introduced the cohomology in uh, using differential forms and that's called the RAM cohomology. And um, I use this symbol but well, this symbol HKZ has an independent uh, uh, definition. And uh, that, when you compute it, has some uh, direct sums of uh, Z, Z to the, uh, some direct sum on many copies of Z. And by the way, the dimension is uh, just the same as HK, the dimension of uh, homology, both the dimension of homology and homology tend to be the same, but uh, in a cohomology over Z with this uh, uh, fancier definition that I didn't tell you also has some torsion uh, terms, uh, which I mean that there are some cyclic groups. Those are not captured by the, the RAM cohomology I gave, and even if uh, you put this condition that the integer, uh, that the periods should be integers. Okay, so this is um, just a asterisk to what I said yesterday. Then, not yesterday, whatever, on Tuesday. The next um, remark about the last lecture is just that I want us to, I want to remind you what, um, where we were. In fact, so I'm showing you this page so that you recognize visually what uh, we're talking about, but I'll uh, uh, now name it as a new part of the Plus, let's uh, just call it destructure because I introduced this uh, definition already last time, but uh, now we start over. Uh, we focus on this, and we saw already that the particular case, first of all, this, uh, the, the case that uh, will be of most interest to me is uh, G is uh, equal to SU3 and D equals 6, just because uh, D equals 6 is relevant uh, for type 2. Uh, string theory and because well uh, an SU3 structure is defined as we saw by a chiral spino in six dimensions on, on the manifold on the six dimensional manifold um, I should also be more careful and specify that uh, I don't want it to have zeros. And this is uh, similar to the condition we saw on the vector, on how a vector field defines, uh, reduces the structural group, but if it doesn't have any zeros. Because at the point where it, um, uh, where it has a zero, it's a stabilizer. It's no longer a situ but rather all of SO6. Okay, we saw uh, that uh, this eta plus has uh, two bilinears. This is, these are by definition completely anti-symmetric. And so they define uh, two, three forms. Now there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence. I wish I could, uh, we could talk about this correspondence for very long because it's in in interesting, but I'll just tell you the, the main features. Mm. So first of all, you may wonder whether there is a also a bilinear like this. This would be allowed 
for example, or eta minus dagger, gamma m eta plus, both would seem to be allowed by chirality. So chirality doesn't tell you that uh, this is zero. So this says chirality plus, gamma m eta minus says chirality plus. But in, this is in fact zero automatically. I won't write it down, uh, I'll just say it in words. Uh, this can be seen by the properties of gamma matrices in six dimensions. One possibility to see it is that there is a basis in six dimensions, six Euclidean dimensions, uh, where the gammas are purely imaginary. Since they also, you also want them to be Hermitian, then they are uh, anti-symmetric. And using that, you can see, so since eta plus dagger is the same as eta minus transpose, then uh, this become, this is the, um, the an element in the diagonal of an uh, anti-symmetric matrix, which is uh, zero. So let me just say by properties automatically, it's like this. It can also be shown in a basis in an independent way. So long story short, there are no other bilinears, uh, non-zero bilinears that you could write with the uh, anti-symmetric indices uh, that you could write um, out of uh, eta plus. There are no other uh, forms. And then maybe it isn't surprising that uh, you can invert. So yesterday we saw, so this formula um, tells us that you can define this arrow going from eta plus to j omega. And it is a little more involved to see that you can go back. And so this j and omega in part because of what I said are uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with the data of, uh, of the Caraspino. And this is kind of central to the whole endeavor of um, making uh, the many of the requirements of string theory mathematical because the dealing with the forms is usually uh, nicer or it is mathematically more developed than dealing with uh, spinos in spite of uh, what we saw about the uh, treatment of spinos in uh, in uh, court spaces uh, the other time and in, we saw already a, an example uh, of this correspondence in the calabio case i just mentioned it i flashed it on the screen uh, at the end of last lecture but already so even with, without any imposing any um, differential conditions on uh, on eta, I, uh, there are some things to be said. So here, j and omega. Uh, so if you go on this way, if you go uh, this um, from eta plus to j omega, then uh, this is the definition. There's nothing to be said. But uh, if you want to go back. Uh, have to be a little more careful. J and omega cannot be just any two, uh, any old uh, two uh, forms. So first of all, this is real by its definition. It can be shown that the, uh, again, by using the fact that uh, the dagger is just a, a um, conjugation followed by transposition, it can be seen that this is real. And instead, this is complex. But there are a bunch of other uh, algebraic identities that um, J and Omega satisfy. And uh, if so, those, if you satisfy those, then you can go back to eta plus. So uh, they can be summarized uh, by the following properties. So J. Uh, let's start with omega. Omega is decomposable. What that means is that there exists one forms, complex one forms. H1, H2, H3. Well, three one forms. H1, H2, H3, such that you can write omega like this. Then there are 
this is a condition that uh, the cube of uh, J, by which I mean J with J with J, is related to omega wedge omega bar. So you one also more both of these are different from zero everywhere at every point. And finally, J with omega is zero. These two together also imply that J can be written in terms of these H. Well, excited about this. H1 wedge H1 bar plus H2 wedge H2 bar plus H3 wedge H3 bar. So, an eta plus without zeros. Point, uh, well, at every point, and at uh, a plus which is non zero, the, this data is in one to one correspondence with the data of, uh, of a two form and a three form with these features. At this point, I didn't even need to specify a metric. There are various other possibilities to, uh, def uh, to uh, so both of these can be viewed as a, so when you define them over, over a manifold, uh, uh, both of these can uh, define an SCT structure. Uh, there are many other possibilities to define an SCT structure. And here notice that I didn't even mention the metric. The metric can be determined from J and omega And this can be done in various ways. Um, I'll tell you two. One is that once you, uh, so here you could just say, oh, omega is decomposable, then uh, you know that these one forms exist and then you throw them away and uh, then all you care is uh, these constraints. Uh, but if you do have these H's, you have found them, then the metric is just determined as H1, H1 bar plus H2, H2 bar plus H3, H3 bar. Uh, notice the difference here. This is just a tensor product, a symmetric tensor product. I usually denote it uh, people, um, including, I think, yourself, uh, unless you are one of those who writes a metric as dt tensor dt plus it, and uh, etc. Uh, if you write dt square, well, you uh, are one of those who writes a metric uh, by just putting a differential after another without any symbol. And uh, equivalently to this, you can say that uh, h1 can be written as E1 plus I E4 and so on. If H2 is E2 plus I E5, H3 is E3 plus I E6. Well, this is a Friedman. These are members of Friedman. Right. So this is one way of determining the metric. Uh, another is, is this. You can define from omega
defines the tensor with one index up and one down. It's called the almost complete structure. What it does is squares to minus one minus the identity. How does it define it? Well, uh, if you, for example, if you have found this HI, uh, this, uh, this I, so the H's are the, by definition, the I eigen forms of uh, of this I. So the eigen forms of I, <laughs> capital I, with eigen value um, small I, the the number such that I square is minus one. Or there are the possibilities in this in B equals six. You can also write some. More concrete formula. Important for memory. This pi is related to y. Okay. And once you have this almost complete structure, let me consistent with, let me be consistent with the, my own notations, you can determine. The metric like this. That's another central point. You can reformulate. So the data of a metric are kind of implicit here. When you have a spino, uh, it means you already have selected the metric. In fact, it, in some sense, it even means that you have selected a field bind. So on the other hand, you can reformulate this data. So I should say then that you reformulate both the data on, of a spinor and the metric in terms of J and omega. So J and omega reconstruct automatically the metric for you. So locally, all this looks a lot like uh, what we saw in plus space. I, I told you, for example, I gave you similar formula for omega and j when we computed the stabilizer of uh, eta. And well, we kind of computed it. And in that case, uh, we have the same formula, but with hi equal dz. But now we'll see that, uh, well, globally, uh, things are not so simple. This is a bit of a detour for what we need uh, about Calabiaus, but it will be useful uh, later on. I decided to say it now rather than pick up the topic again later. So this takes us to the topic of complex structures. So I said that the, the this, uh, this I is an almost complex structure. Why do we have the almost? What do I mean by this almost? Well, this H are um, holomorphic, which you said that's, uh, that's how the name comes. 
uh, with respect to I. But uh, there is no guarantee, like in flat space, that the that there can be written that there exist complex coordinates. such that the ages are proportional. Can be written as proportional to the to some of these ads. And here, I don't know, you can write some coefficients, but this is the requirement. You wanted uh, some z, so coordinates z, complex coordinates. Such that um, this is true. There are many inequivalent, uh, so this is not very practical to check, and there are uh, several inequivalent ways of um, writing this. So, there are some that are uh, liked by mathematicians, some that are liked uh, by physicists. Uh, one way is the following. So you define, so we, uh, the tangent bundle, let's say, is the, is the bundle whose sections are uh, vector fields. And you can define T10 the holomorphic tangent bundle. And the sections are uh, 1, 0 vector fields. And what are they? Well, they are defined in such a vector. Uh, this one such that this happens. So they can be defined by I alone. Already, if uh, I is an almost complete structure, it can be defined. Uh, careful, if you open a, a math book in, of the wrong sort, say uh, an algebra geometry book, they will tend to call this T10M uh, just the tangent uh, for short, because perhaps say, if they are uh, books in complex geometry or algebra geometry, plus they give it, they take it for granted that uh, that's what you're interested in. And it's not the same as the inferential geometry uh, tangent bundle. Okay. And now the first way, so this is my definition of what the uh, complex structure is, but uh, this is equivalent. So the, then you drop the complex, okay, complex structure, not all, they drop the almost. Uh, Complex structure, not almost complex structure. And uh, my first reformulation is that you require that the Lie bracket
of two holomorphic uh, one zero vectors of uh, sometimes they are called holomorphic vector fields are still type one zero so why is this equivalent well you can see one arrow pretty easily if they if this condition is satisfied then there, uh, it means that there are there exist these coordinates that die and then the one zero vectors are they can be written as uh, linear combinations of uh, of these now it's a moment's uh, reflection to see that if you uh, perform the um, the Lie bracket of two such vectors you get another such vector so remember that if you in case you don't remember <laughs> the Lie bracket is just uh, what we um, very simple. So if you consider uh, a vector field as an operator on functions, the Lie bracket is just what we physicists would um, we'll call the, the commutator. So the, uh, the vector field is a generator of some transformation in, um, in, in, on your manifold. And then you are allowed to take the commutator of those two generators. This is uh, how we think of them as physicists. And now you have this condition, uh, which is equivalent to the complex structure. Now, if you um, write this, uh, if you want to, if you're a physicist, you typically don't like this. I mean, you know, like something that you can compute, but it's easy because all the, uh, there's, uh, we introduced earlier this uh, holomorphic projector, pi. And all one zero vectors can be written as being the, in the image of this of such a vector. So then two vectors like this, with, uh, which are in the image of pi, are automatically in, uh, in T10. And now you want to make sure that the uh, the result only has a one zero part and not a zero one part. And that's uh, you can make sure that that happens if uh, by just taking uh, a holomorphic projector applied in this. Okay, so the, this is a good plan. So within this is actually. What uh, this means is that you should take the Q index of all this guy. So you know what, Let, let's write it symbolically. And then if you compute this and you take it, uh, wait a second, real part or imaginary part, let's get confused. You get the famous um, Nehos tensor. So I'm putting in the correct statement. Um, should be the real part. But there is another, uh, so I wanted to mention it because everyone talks about this tensor. So I, I think it's, um, to be honest, uh, rather useless. So the, by far the best way to check integrability is to 
Or is this other condition? There should exist a, a form W such that this is true. That's uh, exactly equivalent to the existence of these complex coordinates. Anyway, so a manifold such that um, there's a complex structure is called the complex manifold. And that's one piece of uh, Calabiao. The other piece is a condition on J. Here I have a lot less to say. J, um, so a manifold is called symplectic. Well, J is uh, called the symplectic structure. If it's closed. Now, if I weren't talking uh, about the context in which we have already uh, said what J is uh, algebraically, I should be a little more lengthy. Uh, I should say, oh, uh, J is a non degenerate uh, to form. And what does that mean? It's just a condition that we have already j cubed from zero. You probably heard the word symplectic already if you, even if you never had a lecture of uh, differential geometry in your life in uh, uh, talking about classical mechanics because the phase space of uh, um, of any physical system well, for most physical systems, is a symplectic manifold. There is such a form. When I say most, is uh, what I uh, have in mind is that there is a, a slight generalization called the Poisson manifold, which I don't want to get into. Uh, I might need to say, if time permits, I'll say something more about the uh, symplectic manifolds. So one. Thing that I say now in words is that they well I think I do need it so let me say now <laughs> that given uh, something that we often need in uh, classical mechanics and we will also tangentially need uh, today is the notion of quotient so sometimes we want to quotient the phase space by uh, symmetries or by uh, putting constraints and constraints and symmetries are uh, often related in, um, in phase space. So, what is a symmetry? It's uh, just a vector whose, uh, what is a symmetry of phase space? Um, well, it's a vector whose um, Lie bracket, whose um, Lie derivative, sorry, leaves J invariant. Now, we need something interesting in uh, differential geometry, which we haven't um, seen so far. On forms, not on every tensor, but on forms, the Lie derivative can be written as a commutator of uh, two operators that we do know, which are the contraction by the vector defined like this and uh, just the, the usual, uh, well, the exterior differential. It's called Cartan. Uh, 
Skeleton's magic form. Why? Well, because it's nice. Now, well, by the way, it's a nice exercise. The formula for the lead derivative of uh, on any tensor, uh, you have probably seen in uh, general relativity, in a general relativity class, uh, the formula for D. And the other and um, the other side uh, are here, and now you can just compute this commutator. Uh, the way we did uh, some other exercise in the in the first lecture. So the, uh, just by using uh, as if you were in quantum mechanics uh, uh, as normal commutators by using the algebra that you know among the the wedges and the and the contractions. So in theory, you have all the ingredients needed to uh, to check this formula pretty quickly. So really, two lines. Um, sorry, two lines. If it's correct, it's an untypeed. By the way, uh, so to I. When you perform that computation, as if it were some uh, commutator in uh, physics, anti commutator in physics, you should think of this as being fermionic. Because, after all, what we do know about uh, what we know about them is uh, they're anti commutator, not the commutator. So, Replacing this formula here, substituting, substituting it here, we have this expression, but now we recognize that dj is, uh, so it should be closed, so dj equals zero. So we have that I, uh, yota psi j is closed. By the Poincare lemma I mentioned, locally, the Tassai J is D of something that I call new psi. That means that. And this is a function because the uh, J was a two form. This thing is a one form and uh, one form is a D of a function. So that means that for any J, for any Psi, uh, which is a symmetry of J, also called simplectomorphism, you can see parlance, uh, there is a, such a function and people call this map Called moment map. Why? Well, because it can be seen in quantum in classical mechanics. It can be seen that this is just the um, the generator, basically, or the conserved quantity associated to to this um, symmetry of, of the. Um, so the data in J, I should say, perhaps, are the same as those in a, um, in, a, in a Poisson bracket. In fact, J can always be written uh, locally as uh, dp wedge dq, maybe dpi wedge dqi. In a, uh, and by locally, I just mean in any, even in a neighborhood, not just at a point. And uh, so they uh, gives you the structure of a Poisson bracket. So then if you have a symmetry in that sense, then uh, you can associate it uh, in 
classical mechanics always uh, what you have a you can associate with a generator and that's uh, this uh, new side very good Why did I spend time on uh, these two, um, on uh, omega and j? Well, you saw that omega defines, so the date of this omega uh, very tightly uh, related to this almost complex structure. And the data of j, well, together with the data of j, they, they can define a metric. So an S3 structure can be thought of as being made of two halves, so to speak. And closure, so we saw that for a Calabiao, both are closed. So I won't write this every time, but when now uh, when I write J and Omega, I mean the forms that they find an SOT structure. So the, uh, again, this cannot be any uh, two forms. They need to satisfy the algebraic constraints that I outlined earlier. But given that, so an SOT structure, which uh, well, whose uh, J and Omega are both closed, is, uh, uh, defines a Calabiao. And we saw that this defines a symplectic structure. And this defines the complex structure. However, uh, this is not exactly one to one. I mean, uh, I can't say that. Uh, so now, Calabiao is then a manifold which is both symplectic and complex. However, it is not quite true that the, uh, a manifold which is both symplectic and complex, uh, an SCT structure which is both symplectic and, uh, and complex, is a Calabiao because of this W. What is a manifold where the W is allowed? Well, so also in this case, we have a symplectic structure and a complex structure. But this is now equivalent. These are equivalent, but uh, this here, the arrow is only one way. Now, Here, the arrow is both ways because complex is equivalent to, to this. And this is the definition of a slightly more general concept called Kähler. So a Kähler manifold is, uh, can be defined as a manifold with, uh, with a, an SCT structure, which is both symplectic and complex. This is still slightly imprecise because the because of a topological issue. There is a generalization of a SU structure, which is called a, a U tree structure, and of an SU tree structure, which is called a U tree structure. In that case, J and omega um, it can still be defined, but omega can only be defined at the cost of being uh, so-called twisted, a twisted form. So it's no longer really a form, but it, um, it is valid. Uh, In 
in a bundle. You see, this, uh, this becomes clear if I write it like this. See that now this looks like a connection, the famous connection that we saw when we were talking about bundles. This is uh, no longer the usual closure, but closure with respect to the to a connection uh, on a on a bundle. I should say here a line bundle. Uh, remember that this is a, a bundle. Rank one, so that it's a, uh, it's a, it is a vector space with a, a fiber C. It's a vector bundle whose fiber is C. But anyway, this is just a fancy uh, way of thinking about this uh, this guy. And the, now this W is. Uh, should not be understood as a, in general, as a one form, but as a connection on this side. This line bundle L, in fact, is, uh, is uh, related to, uh, it's usually, very easy to understand what it is. It is, a, let me say that it's a, um, the bundle of three zero forms, such as omega, is called a canonical bundle. So uh, the, this L is not quite the canonical bundle, but it's, uh, it's inverse. Why? Because uh, if you then say that omega is valued in this bundle, then it's a section of, of uh, the bundle of three zero forms, tensor L. Now, this by definition is k. This I just told you is k minus one. And so this is the trivial bundle. And the trivial bundle always has um, a, a section. Whereas a non trivial bundle, because, the, for example, function is a section of a trivial bundle. But the non trivial bundle uh, might have. Uh, no section, and so there might be a topology without this trick. There might be a topological obstruction to define in omega. Well, there are many other. So there is also the possibility of defining a Keller structure uh, in terms of uh, I, without having to go through all this song and dance with omega. And one possibility is in terms of uh, J and I. And so, for example, we can say we can demand that uh, nabla j and nabla i are zero. It looks, it might look like these conditions are a lot stronger than this. And in fact, also here, uh, uh, the other lecture. On the other letter, I define the Calabria as a manifold uh, such that, that the covariantly constant spin off 
So this might look a lot stronger because it uh, requires a, a covariant derivative instead of an exterior derivative. But well, it turns out that in fact these are um, equivalent. So now, uh, last time I was also asked about polynomy. I answered, but I want to say it now as well. Given a manifold. you know what the parallel transport is. So for example, a vector is transported parallel, parallelly, parallel transported if it is, um, V is transported parallelly if uh, if this is true, um, for any x tangent to gamma. Of course, you know that the, you might remember that the, um, this can be done along the curve, but the initial value of this uh, vector field may not uh, usually it doesn't agree with the final value of this uh, parallel transport on a curved manifold. Usually it doesn't. So there's a rotation acting on V. And if, it, if the path is uh, infinitesimally small, the rotation is related to the, to the Riemann tensor. And this is in turn related to the formula we saw for the, uh, for the commutator of two and Ablas. Now, it so because of this, the infinitesimal, so the, and this is called the, so the, the uh, if you vary among all the possible gamma, if you uh, try all the possible gammas, you uh, get for every gamma a different rotation, and the group of all these rotations, so if you call polynomial rotation, let's say, the one that, uh, uh, that uh, consists in uh, comparing the vector at the beginning and at the end of gamma, then the polynomial group is the group of all, all these uh, polynomials. And uh, you can apply this, of course, to any tensor, not just to V. But the, in principle, so the, this is uh, a subgroup of, uh, of SOD. And uh, when you're lucky, it might be that it, it's a, really a subgroup, a proper subgroup. Now, a general principle. So we saw that the G structure is related to the existence on the manifold of a certain tensor. For example, an SC3 structure is related to the existence of a spinor, a spinor without zeros, or with uh, or of two forms, J and omega, such that blah, 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 the algebraic requirements that we saw. Uh, in the same way, there is a so-called fundamental principle of polynomy, polynomy which says that the, the holonomy is G if and only if there exists uh, a tensor such that, uh, which is covariantly constant. 
Why is that? Well, because the infinitesimal, as you can see from here, the infinitesimal uh, parallel transport is nothing but the, um, uh, it, sorry, the infinitesimal uh, parallel transport is nothing but the covariant derivative. So, if you consider very small paths, uh, very small gammas, then requiring that the holonomy is in G uh, will mean that there is a, um, a some, that the covariant derivative uh, keeps invariant uh, some subgroup of SOP. And the something left invariant by that subgroup will be, um, will be the tense of T. Conversely, perhaps uh, more clearly, if you have a, a T which is covariantly constant, then almost by definition, it means that uh, whatever uh, in which uh, under, uh, with respect to any gamma, you will find that T uh, comes back to itself. So it will be left invariant by, uh, by the holonomy group. And here, then I should say T is a, such that which is going to be constant and with the stabilizer equal to two. So for example, on a Calabiao, then we can say, since we know that there is a, a spin or a pair of J and omega whose stabilizer is SU3, then we see that the holonomy of a Calabiao so as an example of this, we see that the holonomy of a Calabiao is a C2. Now there are several things I want to do with these Calabiaos. First of all, I want to tell you why they are relevant in physics, and then we learn we will learn how to um, actually find them. Uh, why they're relevant in physics is uh, easy, rather easy to explain. The consider in uh, type two. The solution of the type Minkowski, where you make an answer to the type Minkowski times uh, six. Well, even prior to that, if you uh, just put the metric different from zero, but you set to zero all other fields, Ramon, Ramon fields, the D field, and the way for me, M. We go from zero to nine, capital M. And you put also the, let's say the dilaton constant. Then the supersymmetry transformation of the dilatino will be of this form. The epsilon A are the supersymmetry parameters. Um, they are two, uh, in, just because we are in type two. I've seen this in the uh, string theory class. I, um, you might want to see also the other uh, supersymmetry transformations, but they are in fact not needed because they Well, the, the supersymmetry transformations of the of the dilatinos, um, given this assumption, are automatically zero. This would contain the derivative of the dilatino. And well, okay, um, I said here let's put the bosonic fields to zero, but let's also set the fermions to zero. In that case, also the 
on top of the supersymmetry transformations of all the bosons are zero automatically. This is a general feature, in fact. When you set the fermions to zero, then the supersymmetry transformations of all the bosons are zero automatically. It's a fact that you will often use. In fact, from now on, I will always set the fermions to zero. You are welcome to ask me um, what happens if you don't. But basically, you cannot. The reason we do so all the time is that you cannot, uh, in compatifications, you cannot um, do otherwise. Because if you gave a non zero expectation value to fermions, well, they so there's no way of giving an expectation value to fermions without them being also uh, non zero in the space time. And then they would break the symmetry group of your, say, Minkowski uh, in this case. But okay, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's indeed consider Minkowski in this situation. These are 10 dimensional spinos. But uh, they can be decomposed under the different morphism group of uh, Inkowski and that of uh, uh, the internal manifold. So in other words, they can be written as tensor products of spinors in uh, four dimensions and uh, spinors in, uh, um, in six dimensions. Now, I would like to say that this is um, uh, that there's only one way of uh, writing such a factorization. Uh, that's an oversimplification. Let's say that given this answer we made, there isn't uh, so there is not much freedom. So I'm going to tell you the result. And then comment. Sorry. So comments, first of all, these plus and minus, so the, these, the zetas are in uh, Minkowski four, the etas are in, uh, in on N6. The plus and minus are chiralities. The chirality in 10 dimensions is the product of chirality in four and six. And so from this, you see that epsilon one has chirality plus, and epsilon two has chirality minus and plus, depending on what. Well, the upper case is for two A, and the lower for two B. Now, Uh, there are two independent spinos. Well, the why two? Um, the just like in the previous lecture, the ones with the minus are the uh, charge conjugates or Majorana conjugates of the the ones with the plus.
so they're not independent. And uh, this would be a way to decompose uh, spinos. And if I uh, suppose I want to look for now for a supersymmetric solution. Well, when is uh, uh, when does a uh, solution enjoy some symmetry? When it is um, the transformation, the infinitesimal transformation of that uh, symmetry uh, gives uh, zero. So, well, here the symmetry transformations are all zero automatically, in fact, except for one. Now, on the four dimension, uh, on the Minkowski four, the most natural thing is to take zeta to be just constants. Again, I would like to say that uh, this can be all derived and, and it's all completely general. Um, it's very hard to be completely general and reduce here. So uh, let's take all, uh, all I'm saying here, a bit as an answer. It can be shown with uh, some work that uh, for this particular case of Minkowski and with uh, all the fields equal to zero, there isn't anything else. Uh, but it would take me more time to be fully reduced. So forgive me. So if I take this constant, then when I take m equal mu, uh, this will uh, happen automatically. So this will be zero automatically. But what happens if I take m equal small m, an index in the internal directions? Well, in that case, now uh, this m6 is an material manifold, so there's no natural candidate. There's nothing like I was saying, oh, it's constant. And it doesn't even make sense when you're no longer in flat space to say that the spin off is constant. It depends on the choice of your field band, remember. You change your field band, and, um, the spin off changes. So then you should look for manifolds which have covariantly constant spin offs. Now, put here eta 1, eta 2. And it looks like I need to uh, look for manifolds that have two covalent constant spinners. But uh, there's a simple trick. I can take them to be equal. And if we take them to be equal, we can define both of them to be just eta plus. It turns out that if you look for uh, solutions where there are two independent quantity constants, you know, then you can uh, write a, a different answer here. And eventually this will lead to uh, more supercharges. With these answers, how many supercharges we have? Well, now it appears that the, uh, if we solve this equation, if we if I uh, have a manifold in which this is satisfied, I write only uh, the one for eta plus because the one for eta minus is just a complex conjugate. So it's not an independent equation. 
Well, then I have that uh, this equation is satisfied for any uh, constant uh, zeta one plus and zeta two plus. Since in uh, uh, there are two complex independent theta one plus and two complex independent theta two plus in four dimensions in Minkowski four, then uh, there is a total of eight superchargers. Now you had a course about supersymmetry. I remind you that the supercharges that is just the, uh, the space of supercharges is a space of solutions to the uh, equation where um, you set supersymmetry to zero, the supersymmetry transformations to zero. Good, so for Calabiao in particular, we do have this. So Calabiaus lead to Minkowski four times uh, internal space with eight supercharges. Moreover, There is a famous computation. First of all, I mentioned uh, several times the commutator of two, cover of two nablas on a tensor, in particular on a vector field, that's a way to uh, Define the Riemann tensor. There's a similar equality where you see that it's similar because again you have the Riemann tensor acting in a certain way on eta. Now this just the this happens to be just the spin on the infinitesimal spin on relation. In that sense, it's the same equation uh, as the one on the commutator nabla. It's morally the same equation. But then You multiply this by gamma. You get this. And now there's a gamma matrix identity, which is a particular case of uh, one that we saw um, in the first lecture, I believe. Remember that the multiplication from the left by a single gamma matrix has a term that looks like a, where you just put the two together. So if A and B were upper, it would really look like a wedge uh, under the beautiful map. And then a second term uh, that can be written like that. Now, when you substitute this equation here, you'll see that the first term with the gamma m a b times the Riemann gives you um, Riemann contacted with the gamma, which is competent symmetric in three indices. And that vanishes because of the first Bianchi identity on the Riemann tensor. 
Whereas the second term gives a contraction between one index. Uh, so you have a delta MA, so it gives a contraction between the uh, first and uh, third index of the Riemann tensor. And that's the rich tensor. So you get in the end one half uh, Riemann uh, Ricci. The plus. But now what? Now you might remember uh, that these are part of a basis. So you might object that uh, some of those are um, are complex. Sorry, some of those uh, um, annihilate eta, but uh, that only happens when you take a certain complex, complex combination. Instead, if you if this is a real index, uh, then there is no uh, none of these are zero. And it follows that this can only since since on the other hand, each of these current derivatives uh, annihilates eta. Then, because of what I just said, then R n is zero. So this last step would be trickier if you were in a, uh, in a Lorentzian signature, but uh, here you just obtain this. It's part of a general pattern where you know, the supersymmetry, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Before I say that, so in particular, this is Ricci flat. Now, stupid remark I should make. In this, uh, given the answers we made, that all the fields are set to zero except the metric, the equations of motion, set it up here. So these are the supersymmetry uh, transformations, but the equations of motion reduced to R and N equals zero. The space time should be Ricci flat. But since we have taken space time like this, and by this I really mean a direct product, so the uh, line element, the, the one on Minkowski. plus the one of the, in the internal space, we know fancy. Uh, say you could generalize this with a function of the internal space uh, uh, put up here that would be called the walking but all, all of that uh, well you, you can see that it doesn't lead to any generalization so if you take just a direct product like this uh, then the those equations of motion become the this Ricci flatness And this, I was going to say, is part of a general pattern. In general, the, uh, well, maybe this has been mentioned in the other uh, courses, but uh, let me say it anyway. In general, if you, so the um, supersymmetry equations in many field theories um, imply the equations of motion. In other words, um, if a solution is, super, uh, is left invariant by some supercharges, then it is automatically also then it also automatically satisfies the equation of motion. This is um, not completely true for a supergravity theory, uh, such as for type two. But uh, we can say that most of the equations of motion follow with some asterisk. <laughs> so for And the asterisk is exactly due to the step here. So the, uh, the equation showing that the equations of motion imply that the supersymmetry equations uh, imply the equations of motion um, is a glorified version of, uh, of this computation here with uh, where you don't have you know, uh, just this uh, co um, covariant derivative, spinoid covariant derivative any longer, but also 
um, contributions from the other fields, um, the computation becomes a lot more complicated. And the, uh, so believe me, and you almost get this uh, uh, here, instead of getting uh, Ricci flatness, you get the equations of motion, I mean, the Einstein equations. But the, uh, now it's uh, more complicated to, uh, to imply, to, to show that these are all independent. In fact, it is not true in general, in full generality. And another, so, okay. You can write here up to some components. Like there's one component, uh, so here there, there's one that vanishes uh, automatically and, uh, and there's not implied. Let me write up to some components. And another uh, technical requirement is that at some point you use the Bianchi identities for the various fields. So in uh, form notation, for example, well, we have seen that the, um, the F so the um, Maxwell equation, for example, for a two form would be uh, usually is d mu nu rho, d f, d mu f nu rho, where mu nu rho are all anti-symmetrized. And that operation becomes just the exterior uh, derivative of, uh, of the two form f. Now for the three form, the inertial three form, the Bianchi identity is just like this. And then there's uh, a similar Yankee identity for the Ramon Ramon forms. Now I put them in parentheses. I mentioned them uh, the, for now. They, they won't have much of a role, I, uh, but to complete the statement, I needed it. So for compatifications, fortunately, um, there are enough symmetries in the space time that you can relate the components that are not necessarily um, implied by the by supersymmetry to others that are. So for compatifications, you can just forget about this first point. And only the second will, uh, will be needed. Anyway, for Calabians, we are done. Uh, so then if you, uh, of course, if you, we have found in particular the Calabians are richly flat and uh, uh, then is something that they I could probably have told you in, in, the five, in the fifth minute of this uh, lecture series. I could have said, you know, so uh, Calabiaus are relevant for physics because they're richly flat. And the equations of motion for gravity theory when there are no other fields switched on uh, will become RMN equals zero. So period, uh, <laughs> you see already that uh, Calabiaus are important in, uh, in, uh, in a compatification of our skin tier. Good, how do we find them now? This might be lengthy because it would require, uh, so in that side, that to find the many, many Calabiaus you need to into this many, many and the spaces, a lot of algebra geometry, perhaps, but I, we don't need that. So we can just give uh, some simple example with a very little algebra geometry. So, there's a so called projective space, complex projective space. CPN. This is the space uh, CN plus one minus the origin divided by a C star action. 
where all the coordinates z are equally rescaled. In fact, let me start this from zero up to n. So this is the sister action. This is a uh, so the introduced here n plus one compass coordinates other than just n. And uh, well, this C star quotient can be seen as uh, similar to as uh, this, as the following, um, as done in uh, two steps. You can imagine first a, a sphere defined is this locus and then on this space you can perform a quotient by s1 so it's as if uh, you decompose this c star in a quotient by uh, R plus, which consists in um, so the, uh, the the group of, uh, of uh, positive real numbers, and then the uh, by S one, the one by R plus can be uh, thought of as uh, fixing <clears throat> the norm of uh, the overall norm of uh, in your C n plus one to one, and the one by S one gives you C p n. Uh, perhaps you've uh, heard of uh, something called the Hopf vibration, which is the statement that the, uh, if you quotient the three sphere by a, uh, by a certain u1, you get a two sphere. Well, the n equal one case of uh, this is precisely a straight uh, quotiented by a single s1, and that shows that the CP1 is the two sphere. So for this, you can uh, you can show that this is scalar uh, pretty easily, but just by writing down the the two form J and the um, and the form omega, the twisted form omega on this uh, on this space, and the secretly the reason that this uh, such a J exists is that you can view. Um, you can uh, think of this, well, this is plus space and in particular it is symplectic. Um, you can just write uh, the, the stupid form dz not z not bar plus dot dot dot. Cn plus one, this will be closed. Uh, times one over times i over two, sorry, so, matter of convention. And then uh, once you have um, shown that uh, this guy is um, symplectic, which it is because it's closed automatically, then you have that uh, flat space is a symplectic manifold. And we saw earlier that there is this uh, uh, procedure where um, by uh, to a symmetry, you can associate the moment map. Well, 
there is a symmetry uh, here, which is this one. So you can take, well, this speaking is a complex symmetry, but you can consider the U1 inside here. And the moment map for that U1 is nothing but this guy. So there's a general procedure where uh, if you have a, a symmetry of a symplectic manifold and its moment map, now if you put yourself on the level set of the moment map as we are doing here, and then you quotient by uh, the vector field, then you produce another symplectic manifold. This is why I was introducing the moment map earlier. So, there's a general theory of this general portion procedure. And it gives you a J on CPN. Understand that this is uh, th this looks um, a bit too abstract. So I can be a lot more concrete. For example, we, I can in introduce uh, this matrix, a projector. So let me call this R. Of square. I'm going to introduce this matrix. Now, we can define some sort of. Well, the reason I'm. So there's a reason I'm calling this the capital D, but it's just a definition. Pij, it's a project that uh, derivative. It's a projector applying applied to the, the, the Z. And now I claim that um, that this. is the symplectic form on CPM. So it's something very concrete. And uh, so together, so there's also a way to define an omega. Uh, so to write it. And that omega is just defined. I mean, the almost complex structure here, it's an almost, it's a complex structure too, and it's defined so that the uh, the ZIs are, um, uh, it's a uh, compass coordinates. So here I have already in my, um, in front of me, the compass coordinates. I don't need to, to introduce projectors. And I can give you complete expression also for the for the omega. So I'm sorry, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure if these are written anywhere, uh, um, but they're true. So in particular, now you can compute if this uh, omega is uh, closed or not. It turns out it is not closed, rather, there's a non-zero W here. So this is in fact Kähler. Uh, 
and not um, and not color BR. You might say, well, perhaps I can change omega and make this W go away. But there's in general a topological obstruction uh, to doing that. And this has to do with the, uh, with the bundle K we were referring to. So remember that this W is a connection on that bundle. I remember also that I um, told you that sometimes you can make a, a bundle to be trivial if you change your, um, if you perform a uh, gauge transformation in every patch. But uh, something that tells you whether you can achieve that or not is the first chain class of that bundle. So a bundle. particular line bundle. So the bundle, uh, this means that the fiber C. It's trivial if and only if it's uh, first string class is zero. Remember how we compute that first string class? We compute it by uh, looking for a connection and then um, we look at the periods of that connection of our various two forms. Well, here, the, what is the, what can that connection be? It's really W. So the first chain class here, this is related to the W. But here you can be a little bit more careful because this W um, in principle could be any form, but the, you see this has um, N holomorphic uh, legs. This in general, so in any uh, here put a CPN, but for example, if you like N equal three, or this discussion, let's say, then this will be a three zero form as we saw, it's a three form. Otherwise this, uh, I did it in N dimensions and put in N complex dimensions, but uh, let's say we're interested in uh, CP3 now. Well, this will be a three zero form and uh, this could be, could have a one zero part and a zero one part, but the one zero part will go away because the, there is no four zero form. And so uh, this is, uh, we can assume it to be a zero comma one form. And uh, having specified that, I can now in a conscience say that C1 is related to DW. Well, to the, sorry, the C1 is the cohomology class of DW. So indeed, if you can send W away, uh, then you win and you um, you can find that your manifold is a color BR. But here, it turns out that you can compute the chain class of this CPN and it's uh, not um, non-zero. So C1 of uh, CP3 instead is Four. Now we might say, well, does that mean? Like, how can it be a number? What I mean by that is that uh, the cohomology, the homology of uh, CP3, or in fact of CPN in any dimension, is one. There is only one two cycle, which is a copy, in fact, of CP1. You obtain it by setting all of these complex coordinates to zero except one. So there's a single S2, they're all homologous to each other. All these S2s are all homologous to each other. So your C1, uh, I told you that you need to compute the periods of, uh, of this uh, two form on all the generators of the homology group, but there's only one. 
So in this sense, uh, so uh, if you uh, integrate it, you will get four. And so in this sense, um, the CPN is not labial. So the, the signals, in this sense, C1 is four, and uh, the signals that the um, CPN is not labial. However, it turns out, and now this uh, be, will become trickier to, to explain, to uh, fully establish. If you have the locus of a, suppose you consider the locus of a, a function inside CPN, things improve. Now, for this to be uh, to really be sensible, this function should be homogeneous. Why? Because uh, we have this identification. If you work in with this uh, context coordinates, Z1, Zn, we should make sure that uh, uh, f equals zero should um, uh, the locus f equals zero should be consistent with this. So, say if I wrote Z1 equals z2 squared. Well, then this wouldn't make any sense because the under this uh, uh, rescaling, a lambda would appear here and the lambda square would appear here. So the equation changes under this uh, identification. Not good. So the way to avoid that is to consider f to be homoge homogeneous, so the, all the monomials in the, with the same degree. And let's say that it has degree d. It turns out now that C1 of this, let's call it Z of F, the zero locus of F. Let's uh, use a even more com complete notation. Let's say the zero of F in CPN. Well, the, it's uh, C1 is in fact no longer N. So, uh, sorry, here it was uh, three. In general, it would be C1 of CPN would be N plus one generalization of this fact but uh, here would be n plus one minus b and tempted to uh, tell you more about this but i can tell you that the uh, tangent bundle of the sub manifold is um, a certain quotient of the tangent bundles of uh, CP, uh, a certain quotient of the tangent bundle of uh, CPN. And this is how you compute this, you find this result. But then if we see how to proceed. We want a manifold, so the dimension of this, so this zero locus uh, has dimension what? complex dimension mm -hmm. equal to, well, if, uh, if it was just CPN, it would have complex dimension and but we have imposed a single equation here. So uh, that cuts a locus of uh, um, co-dimension, complex co-dimension one. So the dimension is n minus one. What do we want for our um, aims is uh, to, to have this equal to three. So we want to work with CP4 instead of CP3 as we did before. But from this, since we want C1 equals zero, we need D equal five. So this locus then uh, 
such that this obstruction goes away. And now you can, once the obstruction goes away, so the, the, this becomes uh, uh, exact and the, by uh, just by rescaling uh, omega, you can send that away and you can solve the omega equation. This is called the quintic. And it's the uh, easiest example of a calabial. It's time to confess that I um, swept um, something under the carpet uh, in my presentation. So the In particular, that arrow that uh, shows that um, dj equals zero, d omega equals zero. So the, I made it uh, summed up a little too simple, perhaps. Uh, at what stage? Well, here, where we where I said that if c one equals zero, I can uh, I can solve this. This can be achieved pretty easily, but uh, there is a problem. I just said that, uh, oh, you rescale, uh, you have to rescale omega. So let me, so two, once C1 equals zero, uh, you can rescale. So DW, mm, he said DW is zero, so W is D of something. Now you can rescale omega, in other words, E to the F omega. So that it's zero. And you might say, okay, yeah, we're done. We, it's enough to re redefine omega. Yeah, but the issue is this. Remember that we have this condition. The if you rescale this now, you'll have um, no longer the you'll satisfy no longer the right normalization you wanted, but you will satisfy the normalization with this function f. So you have now uh, repaired the condition for uh, the closure condition, but it seems like you have broken one of the algebraic uh, conditions that we needed for an SCT structure. Fortunately, Yao proved that You can do this. You see, if you send, if you also uh, redefine J so that it's uh, J, uh, the old J uh, plus this. Now, the symbol D is called the Dolbo differential. It's very sim similar to the to the exterior differential, but it only involves the compass coordinates. And this is its uh, compass conjugate. And 
if you redefine this, then if J was closed, now it is still closed. You can check that this. And now we might say, oh, but they, if I uh, do this redefinition, everything becomes more complicated. But yeah, proofs. That for any F, there exists a lambda such that this is satisfied. And so now your new, um, the pair with omega and j to satisfy the condition for an city structure and you uh, finally have shown that you have a Calabria. Hmm. Two minutes, so I think I will not start the next topic. So, okay, let's summarize what we have seen. We have seen uh, the various possible definitions, I would say, of a trabial in the sense that we have seen several possible definitions of a complex manifold. And then we have seen that if it's also symplectic and the, the two define an SCT structure, then it's a Calabial. And then we have seen how to produce, we also have seen what a Kähler uh, manifold is. It's something uh, which is quite a bit less than a Calabial. And we have seen that uh, how to that it's uh, there exists um, explicit uh, Kähler manifolds such as this uh, CTN. There are also generalizations which is uh, which are also very explicit. But those cannot be these very explicit ones cannot be Calabials, so, such as the CTN. But then I've shown you that there is a, a simple trick where the obstruction for it to become a Calabial goes away, and I've given you an example. This uh, quintic submanifold of CP or CP4. Once again, I'm, so it's possible to generalize this in various ways. And I have shown you that it. Uh, so I have told you <laughs> this. I haven't proven this theorem. This is the called the Yao's theorem. That, um, in fact, if this obstruction, this topological obstruction, goes away, uh, such as in this case for the quintic you can uh, prove that the uh, manifold is a uh, uh, real. So it is simple and it doesn't require fancy mathematics to, um, to find the Keller manifold. Uh, it, and then with, thanks to some, uh, some, some tricks and some uh, art here and by Yao, you can also find a uh, sub manifolds usually, uh, Calabiao manifolds. We also, we also have seen why these are important in physics because they provide the internal space for um, for an incrustable Next time, we're going to see a bit more about the physics of uh, such a quantification. In particular, I want to tell you at least something about the um, the effective action that you obtain when you compatify um, on uh, Calabiao. And then we, we will start modifying the, 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 this compatification by switching on some additional fields. But we will remain Minkowski for the next, uh, so in, uh, within the Minkowski uh, topic in the next uh, lecture. And then we will start, uh, for the lecture, we will start getting even more general and considering, for example, anti deceptive Ooh. Okay. I will now stop recording if I'm
manage the meeting is not responding. Please tell me that you're still here. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, good. No, because I've um, been interfaced to be. We can see your screen. You can see me. Uh, no, your screen. You're frozen. Pardon? You're frozen. We don't see your face. You can see my face. The... No, we, we cannot see your face. What can you see? Your screen, maybe. Okay, maybe. I don't know if it's frozen. Try to do something. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I don't. Uh, but... We can see the screen. Okay. So, all I care is that uh, live on YouTube, this is the cartoon. Uh, stop recording. Now, it's maybe.